Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what my responsibility as chair are, but maybe <laughs> and, yeah, as opposed to just sitting there. Right? Uh, but but uh, as a, one thing I should add to, to Eva's introduction, we should also thank Eva as an organizer. Mm -hmm. That uh, uh, this is a school, not a conference. So questions are even more encouraged than they would usually be at conferences. And you should uh, keep in mind that this is aimed at people who want to learn the material as opposed to those people who already know it. Good point. <laughs> but now let's get going with our first speaker, Enrique Bursin from Inter, who will teach us about introduction to Poisson geometry. Okay. So um, thanks a lot for the invitation to be here. Um, as Eva said, I was supposed to teach this mini course two years ago in Italy. Unfortunately, the event was canceled, so I'm very glad to be here now. And, um, and as Eckert said, um, this is the introductory course to Poisson geometry. It's by now a tradition in this Poisson event to have this very basic course the week prior to the main event, to the conference. And, um, and again, um, what Eva mentioned about red being the color of energy, I apologize in advance if I lack some energy because of the long journey and jet lag. Um, so I came yesterday um, after a long flight. But anyway, so here. Oh, okay, good. Um, all right, so as I said, this is like the basic course in Poisson geometry, and I'm happy to see lots of new faces here. And um, what I'll try to do here is not only cover the basics, uh, but also present some tools that are currently used um, in Poisson geometry. And um, as, much, as much as I can, um, highlight connections between, you know, the concepts that will come up in these lectures and talks this week and next week, okay, for those who stay on for the conference. <laughs> and there's no battery. Let me change them. I have battery singles. Could I use this? Yeah, you can use the. It doesn't work here. Okay, good. So here's a, thank you. So here's a plan um, for the lectures. So today we have two lectures back to back. And what I hope to do is to present the main definition and examples of Poisson manifolds in the first lecture and their basic properties in the second lecture. And then lecture three is about, you know, these this tools and, and, and that I mentioned before. So the algebraids and symplectic groupoids in the fourth lecture is about a pretty important, um, you know, I think relatively modern point of view to Poisson structures that sees them as part of something more general called Dirac structures. Oh. And here are some references. So um, I think it, it's very difficult to teach a basic course in Poisson geometry and say more than what is in the very original paper by Alan Weinstein from 1983. So it's still a very useful reference, you know, the original paper on the subject. There are many books on the subject by now by several authors. And there's a, a new addition to the literature, um, a very recent one from this year, uh, a book by, by uh, Marius Kreinick, Ray Fernandez, and Yuan Markut, which I think is highly recommended. And so here's an outline for, you know, for today. So I'll start telling you about the Poisson bracket as opposed to a Poisson bracket. So the original one, um, give you some motivation and then go on to definitions and you know, present some classes of examples of Poisson manifolds. And then in the next lecture, go to basic theory. Okay, so um, 
here's a picture of um, Simon Denis Poisson, who wrote the formula there on the on the on the right, um, who is the you know which is the Poisson bracket, and so the origin of Poisson geometry is in his work um, in the early nineteenth century. Um, there was a long period of, of dormancy, and the subject was revived in the 70s and 80s of, of last century. Um, and, and nowadays, it really, you know, is at the crossroads of many subjects in mathematics. So here's an illustration of this fact, several topics that, um, you know, you may be interested in that are related um, to Poisson geometry. Okay, so I'll try to highlight some of these connections along the way. Okay, so let me start talking about the Poisson bracket. Okay, so this was introduced, as I said, in the early 19th century in the work of Poisson, and he was interested in, in, in having a formulation of classical mechanics motivated by concrete problems in celestial mechanics. And um, as a summary of, of, of the setup of geometric mechanics, um, what we have is the following. So usually we have a space that we call the phase space, you know, which is for him it was R to N with coordinates Q and P's. This is supposed to represent Q, Q's are the configuration of possible particles and the P's, the, the momenta or velocities. Um, then the dynamics of a mechanical system is governed by a distinguished function called the Hamiltonian that you know, each problem has its Hamiltonian. And the way you produce the vector field, whose time evolution is what you're interested in, um, is by taking the gradient of the, of the function. Um, do I have a light a pointer here? Oh, okay. Anyway, so you take the gradient of the function and you rotate it a little bit with this matrix. And you get this vector field and the time, you know, the, the Integrating this vector field is equivalent to solving Hamilton's equations. Okay, so that's what you're interested in. That's, that, that's what is the time evolution of a mechanical system. And in this context, you know, Poisson introduced the following operation. So given two functions in R2N, you know, you write this kind of combination of their derivatives. Okay. And um, you may wonder why he bothered um, writing this expression. And well, there's a clear dynamical meaning to it, which is basically the fact that, you know, bracketing a function H with a function F is the same thing as measuring the rate of change of F along the Hamiltonian flow of H, okay? And why do you care about that? So back then, people were particularly interested in conserved quantities to solve differential equations. Right? So if you have a function f that um, we call this their involution when the Poisson bracket is zero, um, that is preserved by the Hamiltonian flow of, of, um, of H, this means that you know, if you take a level set of the function that the Hamiltonian vector field is tangent to it, and therefore the dynamics is constrained to this level set. If you have enough of these guys which are independent, you know, the hope is that you constrain the dynamics enough until you can actually completely solve the problem. Okay, so that's the idea of integrability. So people looked for many conserved quantities, okay, to try to solve the, the, the differential equation. Um, and then in this context, there was a theorem that Poisson was able to prove um, using this kind of shorthand notation for that expression. And the theorem was the, the following, that if you know a conserved quantity F for the Hamiltonian H, and you know another one, G, if you take their Poisson bracket, that's a new function, that's also a conserved quantity. Okay, so you can kind of produce new conserved quantities out of old ones. Uh, so that's, you know, that's one of the things that he could do with this notation, so to say, okay? And later, um, about 30 years later, you know, Jacobi um, understood that in fact, it was a general property of the Poisson bracket, um, what is now called the Jacobi identity. And it is a Jacobi identity that is behind Poisson's theorem. Um, and a few years later, 
um, about four years later, you know, Lee started a systematic um, study of objects that satisfied this Jacobi identity called Lee algebras. Okay, so this is all in the 19th century. And as I said, you know, not, not much happened in Poisson geometry for a while, for about a century. Um, and, you know, the modern era started in the 70s and 80s of the last century. Um, and I think a lot of people were involved in it. Um, I put the pictures here of Lichnorovich and Weinstein. Yeah, I could mention Kirillov and, I don't know, Kostin to many other people. And, and the motivations were, you know, there, there are many motivations for, for um, Lichnorovich and Weinstein to divide the subject. Um, so some of the mo motivations came from representation theory, I think more Kirillov. Um, of course, still the understanding of mechanical systems, but not only systems of particles, but also um, continuum mechanics. Um, so Weinstein in particular um, got to Poisson geometry um, by studying the Hamiltonian nature of certain equations in plasma physics called the, the maxwell vlasov equations. Um, Mishnarovich was involved in, um, in the formulation of quantization called deformation quantization that also involves Poisson structures. So there were, there were several um, motivations um, for, 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 for this. So let's go to the definition. So the basic definition is this, that if you have a differentiable manifold M, a Poisson bracket um, is a Lie bracket on the algebra of smooth functions. Right, so it's still symmetric and satisfies the Jacobi identity, and there is a third um, a property called the Leibniz identity, which basically says it, it, like this derivation property. Okay, it's the behavior of the Lie bracket is that like compatibility of the Lie bracket with respect to the commutative product of functions, and the pair M with the bracket with the Poisson bracket is what we call a Poisson manifold. And there is a natural motion of Poisson map, um, which is basically a map that when you see like in terms of the pullback as a map of functions preserves the brackets. And with the notion of a Poisson map, you can make sense, for example, of um, Poisson submanifolds, right? Which are submanifolds of a Poisson manifold for each the inclusion is a Poisson map. Um, as you're gonna see, there are many other um, interesting notions um, of submanifolds in Poisson geometry. This is just one. And of course, with that, you can talk about Poisson diffeomorphism, which are you know, a notion of equivalence in Poisson geometry. But I point out that there are also you know, much weaker notions of equivalence that also play a role in the theory, like Morita equivalence, for example. Um, okay, so something that is very important. Um, and that gives this dynamical interpretation for the Poisson bracket is the notion of Hamiltonian vector fields. So whenever you have a function, you can produce a vector field out of this, this function using the Poisson bracket, you know, using this Leibniz property, right? So if you see this as acting in functions, it acts as a derivation. And therefore it has to be the lead derivative with respect to a vector field, okay? And, um, I should also say that if a function Poisson commutes or is in involution um, with any other function, it's called a Casimir, okay? It's the same thing as saying that it's Hamiltonian vector field is zero. And there are some immediate properties that one can derive from um, the Poisson structure. So the first one is that by skew symmetry, you know, any function F is preserved by its Hamiltonian flow. Right, just because the Poisson bracket is skew symmetric by definition. Okay, so in particular, you know, the Hamiltonian flow of a function is always constrained to the level sets of the function. Okay, but the interesting thing is to find like other, fun other functions which are conserved, which are independent of the Hamiltonian. Um, and of course, because of the Jacobi identity, this theorem by Poisson still holds, of course, in a general Poisson manifold, meaning that if you have two conserved quantities, their Poisson bracket is conserved as well. And um, so this is one of the exercises in the problem set that you will have access to. Um, 
which basically says that this correspondence between functions and vector fields, even by taking Hamilton vector fields, is bracket preserving. Okay. Uh, of course, the Poisson bracket that I introduced before is an example of a Poisson bracket. See if there's anything else. So um, I prepared these slides after having my notes to save some time, so I don't really know what's in there anymore. Okay, so that's one point point of view to the story. So that's one definition. Okay, there's a second point of view that turns out to be very useful, which is tensorial. So there's a tensorial incarnation of Poisson structures, and this comes from the fact that it's again you know it comes from this dynamical interpretation of the poisson bracket so something that this tells you is that the poisson bracket depends only on the differential of the functions not on the functions right and this by skew symmetry this is the same thing as right so because it only depends on the differential of the functions not the functions you know you can actually oh so you can actually write it in terms of a bivector field which is a section of the second exterior power of the tangent bundle um, in this way, okay? So there's a tensor that codifies the Poisson bracket and we call it the Poisson by vector field. And local coordinates, that's how a Poisson bracket looks like. Um, so these coefficients are just the Poisson brackets of the coordinate functions and this is the Poisson structure written in terms of the bivector field. Okay, so that's how they look like locally. Um, so you can also take the point of view of starting with a bivector field and wondering when it gives rise to a Poisson bracket by the formula up there, right? So if you start with a bivector field, write this bracket and this turns out to be a skew symmetric bracket that satisfies the Leibniz condition but it may not satisfy the Jacobi identity that doesn't happen for free so this poses an additional integrability condition on the tensor so Jacobi is not for free in this formulation Okay, but um, if you if you um, define the expression that we call the Jacobiator, the expression that you would like to be zero plus cyclic permutation. So this is the expression that you would like to be zero to define a Poisson structure. It turns out that it satisfies. It's another, you know, this is actually an exercise in the problem set. It's a generalization of the previous one I mentioned. It satisfies this kind of nice formula, okay, that you're going to prove. It's a very simple calculation. But there are many things that you can read out from this. Um, <clears throat> one is, again, that the Jacobiator only depends on the differentials of the functions. You know, it's too symmetric, so it can move these things around, right? So it only depends on differentials and not on functions. Um, and therefore, as a consequence of that, um, well, there are other things that you can read of. You know, one is that on a Poisson, something that I didn't say, but on a Poisson manifold, whenever this is zero, um, the Poisson by vector field is preserved by any Hamiltonian vector field, yeah? Yes, sorry, yeah, good. There's an H missing here. Yeah, this is what happens when you prepare slides after midnight. So be prepared for more typos like that. 
Um, okay, so as I said, one consequence is, is this, that you know, if the Jacobi identity holds, the, the Poisson bivector field is preserved by the Hamiltonian, by any Hamiltonian vector field. But what is important here for me now is the fact that the Jacobiator only depends on differentials. And therefore, it also has a tensorial incarnation. So there is a tri-vector field, a section of wedge three of TM that represents this Jacobiator in this way. And why is this relevant? Um, this is nice because, you know, if you want to check that the Jacobiator is zero for a certain bracket, it's enough to check that it's zero. For example, if you have coordinates, you know, for the coordinate functions. Okay, so this is a very useful thing. Rather than testing this, it can every functions, you only need to put in coordinates. Um, and it turns out that this tri-vector um, can be naturally described in terms of the so-called scalping bracket. Um, I won't really make much use of the scalping bracket here, but you know, being a introductory course, I should mention at, at, you know, at, at least what, what they are, what this bracket is. Okay, um, so it turns out that you know you're all familiar with the bracket, data bracket, vector fields. And it turns out that there's an extension of this bracket to multi-vector fields, where by a multi-vector field. I mean sections of the zero power of the tangent bundle. And, and that's how you extend the bracket, right? There's some kind of you know, graded skew symmetry and um, some graded Leibniz condition. Um, it turns out that you know, um, if you have, you know, if one of your entries is a vector field, then this is just the usual lead derivative. So it acts on, you know, so if you put a function here, it's just the lead derivative. And if you put a vector field here, it's just a commutative bracket. Okay, but you extend this to all multi-vector fields. Um, actually, an interpretation of this bracket as the Poisson bracket now on a greater or super space. Um, so it's a very natural object. And um, yeah, so the point is that having that in mind, so now we can really summarize by you know, having two, definition of Poisson, two definitions of Poisson structure. So one is um, a Poisson bracket, a Lie bracket on the smooth function, on the algebra of smooth functions that satisfies the Leibniz identity, or a bivector field that satisfies this additional quadratic equation that will tell you that this bracket here, so the relationship between, the correspondence between the two viewpoints is this formula. Right, and this integrability condition is what makes this bracket satisfy the Jacobi identity. Okay, so that's the summary of this first 20 minutes. So we have two viewpoints which are equally important. Right, so one, you know, might be more convenient if you have a more algebraic mind. For example, this makes sense if you replace C infinity of M by any commutative algebra. So you can talk about Poisson algebras, for example, right? Anyway. Um, so there's another um, object naturally associated <clears throat> with um, a Poisson manifold that turns out to be very important that I want to mention. Just called the characteristic distribution. And this makes contact, I think, with the mini course that Camille will be teaching on singular foliations. So the idea here is that if you have a Poisson manifold, and now I'm going to represent my Poisson structure by a bivector field, there's a very natural map that you can consider going from the cotangent bundle to the tangent bundle of the manifold, which is basically contracting um, the bivector field with uh, a co-vector, and that gives you back a, a, a tangent vector, right? Um, in turn, well, this is the map 
if you want. This is precisely the map that takes the differential of a function in the Hamiltonian vector field of the function. Okay. And you can look at the image of this map. I call it R for range. This gives you a distinguished subspace of the tangent space of the manifold at each point. Right? So, this is what, is what I call a distribution, so the, the characteristic distribution. So, by a distribution here, so generally they are defined as uh, just a sub bundle of the tangent bundle of a manifold. Um, I'll have a more um, general definition in mind that, as I said, I think will connect with Camille, we'll be talking about in his mini course, which is simply um, an assignment that to each point of a manifold gives you a subspace of the tangent space at that point. Maybe like a generalized, sometimes it's called a generalized distribution. I'll call it distribution just because I'll refer to, to the usual one as constant rank or regular distribution. Um, and there's a notion of smoothness for these objects, which is the following. So is the property that if you if you fix um, any vector um, at a distribution at a given point, then there exists a vector field um, on manifolds uh, with the property that it extends this vector that you fixed at any other point, it's tangent to the distribution. Okay, and it turns out that this distribution here is smooth. Okay, that's something simple to check. So it's smooth in this sense. Okay, whenever a distribution comes as the image of a vector bundle map to the tangent bundle, um, it will be smooth. Okay, good. So, um, so now let me define the rank. Oh, so something else that I should say is that another way of defining this is because of this property is in terms of Hamiltonian vector fields. So at any given point, this characteristic distribution is basically given by all the Hamiltonian directions in that point all directions that can be realized by a Hamiltonian vector field at that point. Okay, so this gives you some kind of distinguished um, distribution on any Poisson manifold. And I'll say that, so I'll call the dimension of the, this distribution at a given point, um, the rank of the Poisson structure at that point. I'll say that the Poisson structure is regular if this characteristic distribution is um, regular, has constant rank, and uh, non-degenerate if the characteristic distribution is the whole tangent bundle, in which case this anchor map is necessarily an isomorphism by dimensions, right? And one of the questions that one wonders about here is whether this distribution is integrable, meaning whether it's tangent to submanifolds at every point, okay? Um, so we'll see that they are, but at this point, you can already check, at least assuming that this distribution has constant rank, it's a simple exercise to use, where is it? Uh, this property here, uh, 
So an exercise, we can use this property here to check that at least in the constant rank case, um, this distribution, this characteristic distribution is always involutive. And by Frobenius theorem, will be necessarily integrable, okay? In the general case, it's a bit more complicated than that, but we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, good. Um, where am I? So now I'll pass to my list of examples of Poisson structures, okay? Um, any questions so far? Why is it more complicated in the general case? Because there is no Frobenius theorem in the sense that involutivity um, doesn't really guarantee you know, the formulation of what you need to require from your distribution. What, what's the definition of integrability in the more general case? Yeah, okay. The definition of integrability, I'll say that good. So I'll say that a distribution like this um, is integrable if um, so integrability. So we'll talk about this a bit later, but let me just define. If for any point of your manifold, there exists a submanifold containing that point with the property that the paging bundle of that submanifold agrees with the distribution at the points of that submanifold. Okay. So the, the maximum of submanifolds, connected submanifolds with this property is what would be called leads of some whatever singular foliation or something. But in principle, what you have to check is this: is that through any point, if you fix a point, you can find you know this like in the neighborhood of that point a submanifold that realizes the distribution as its tangent bundle. Okay? Well, yeah. I mean, if it's a tangent bundle, then it's a constant rank. No, no, the, the, well, it is constant rank at points of the submanifold. Oh, okay, very soft. Yeah, so it's restricted to the submanifold. So the point is that um, the characteristic distribution will satisfy this property, we'll see that, okay? And then there's a, a, an additional argument to go from that into what is called the foliation. Okay. To define leaves. Anyway, whatever. So the first example um, is a very simple example that I call trivial because it is really trivial, um, which is just the Poisson structure that is zero. There's nothing that prevents you from declaring zero to be a Poisson structure in the definition. Okay, so in particular, any manifold whatsoever can be regarded as a Poisson manifold with this trivial structure. And as trivial as it is, it's still kind of useful to have that in mind. Okay, so for example, if you consider if you consider a map, a Poisson map. Poisson manifold to Rn with the zero Poisson structure. This is the same thing. This is the same thing as finding a collection of n functions that Poisson commute with each other, which is something, as I said, related to this integrability. So this zero Poisson structure does appear. In, in concrete and non-trivial situations. Anyway. Okay. The other example, also very simple, is that of a vector space. And on a vector space, you can define constant Poisson structures by taking just by vectors, so elements two of the vector space, let's say real vector space, finite dimension. In this context, 
there's a remark I want to make, which will be an exercise, a problem in the problem set as well, which is that um, in the case of a vector space and one of these by vectors, again, you can consider this map going from the vector from the dual of the vector space to the vector space. And you can consider a subspace of V given by the image of this map. And then something interesting happens that um, on this space, you can define a skew symmetric form, bilinear form, in the following way. Sign for things to match. here and what you're going to check it's very simple is that this formula actually defines a skew symmetric to form in the image of a bivector field like that so in particular the image or you know of this bivector field um, i didn't say that but this form is also non-degenerate that's an important thing so in particular the image of a bivector like that has to be even dimensional Okay, so there's actually a correspondence between my vectors in the vector space and pairs R omega R, where R is a subspace of V and omega R is a skew symmetric bilinear form that is non-degenerate. Okay, so that's the exercise. Um, that already relates, and we'll see that you know a differential geometric version of this fact relates Poisson geometry to symplectic geometry. But there is something that is basic linear algebra that lurks behind this. Okay, so there is like this description in terms of um, non-degenerate two forms of bivectors on vector spaces. Good. Now, um, any bivector field in two dimensions is automatically a Poisson bivector field. Again, because of this tensorial description, in 2D, so in 2D, in two dimensions, um, what happens is that this guy, the tri vector, and if M is two dimensional, this space here has just trivial elements, only the zeros there. Okay, so any bivector field whatsoever. So, for example, in the plane, you just choose your favorite function, and you know they are actually this form. Okay, so these are examples. Um, and another important class of examples are symplectic manifolds. So here, familiar with the definition of what a Poisson manifold, what a symplectic manifold is. So this is a two form, non-degenerate, meaning that many ways to express this, but this map is an isomorphism, right? Um, so on, um, you know, on, on, I guess, any, if you have any manifold with a non-degenerate two form, you can talk about Hamiltonian vector fields in this sense. So given any function, you can define a vector field by the requirement that it satisfies this equation. Okay. 
put differently, the vector field is the inverse under this isomorphism of its differential. Right? And once you have that, this notion of Hamiltonian vector field, then you can immediately define a bracket like this. And then the exercise, it's also in the problem set. So you see, like to, to, to write this, I didn't really use the fact that the form is closed, which is a requirement for a symplectic manifold. So the exercise is that the form is closed if and only if the Jacobiator of the corresponding bracket is zero. So the upshot is that symplectic structures form a, a class of Poisson structures, which are exactly those which are not degenerate in the sense that I defined before. Those for which the characteristic distribution is the whole tangent bundle. Okay, good. Um, another class of examples is quotients by symmetries. So what do I mean here? So for this example, what I mean is the following. Suppose that you have a Poisson structure, a Poisson manifold, and you have a Lie group acting on it. Suppose that the action is nice, free and proper, in such a way that um, you can talk about the orbit space. The orbit space is a nice manifold for which the, the projection is a submersion. Okay. Um, then the exercise here is to check that very function, oh, sorry, and the most important thing is that this is by Poisson details. The action preserves the Poisson structure. So the exercise is to check that the invariant functions closed under the Poisson bracket. And with that in mind, you use the fact that the invariant functions on the manifold, they are isomorphic with the functions in the base. Um, so basically via pullback in this case. Right? So if this guy inherits a Poisson bracket, so does this. Okay? So the base manifold will be a Poisson manifold, and the projection is a Poisson map by the way we defined it. Okay? So in particular, a particularly important situation is. When this guy is symplectic. So if you have a symplectic manifold, uh, that's actually another exercise is to see that on a symplectic manifold, if you have a Poisson diffeomorphism, this is the same thing as a symplectomorphism. Okay. Um, but, but this is not really true if it's not a diffeomorphism. So the notions of a map that preserves Poisson brackets and a map that preserves symplectic forms is really different. So this is also a problem in the problem set. You have to understand that. Okay, but for, for, for diffeomorphisms, the notions of maps agree. And um, this says that, so if you have a symplectic manifold acted upon by a Lie group in a nice way by symplectomorphisms, then the quotient is Poisson. Notice that, for example, 
you know, if this is symplectic, therefore even dimensional, if you mod this out by a circle, this will be all dimensional and there is no chance that this will be symplectic, but there's something rem reminiscent from this symplectic structure down in the quotient, but it's a true Poisson structure, non-symplectic. Okay. And this is very important, for example, in mechanics. Um, um, what else? So there's a, a, a particular case. There's a particular case of this observation about quotients. So you see like one way to think about why it would pass from symplectic to Poisson geometry is actually having this in mind. So you see that the symplectic world, the symplectic category is not closed under quotients by symmetries. And if you want to close the category, you have to pass to Poisson manifolds. Then you can take quotients and we're still, you still get the same kind of object. Okay. Um, so um, a particular case of this that I think um, is very important, a, a concrete case is if you have a Lie group acting on itself, let's say by left multiplication or right, and you lift the action to the cotangent bundle, which is always symplectic, right? And um, that, so this action will be free and proper, and the quotient by this action is identified with the dual of the Lie algebra just because this is trivializable. So from the previous discussion, this says that the dual of any Lie algebra um, acquires a Poisson structure. And a formula, yeah, so the formula for that on the dual of a Lie algebra at a certain point is like this. Well, I won't really worry about signs. So that's the explicit formula for the bracket. On the dual of the algebra. And here, you know, there are some identifications going on. So, you know, F is a function on the dual of the Lie algebra. Its differential at a point can be identified with the dual of the dual of the Lie algebra. I'm um, in finite dimensions. So this is the Lie algebra again. So with this identification, I take just the, the Lie bracket in the Lie algebra. So out of the Lie bracket, I hook up a Poisson bracket for functions from the dual of the Lie algebra. Okay. Yes. Does it hold for homomorphic Poisson What hold? The questions. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll mention them in a bit, but yes, um, many things hold. I don't know exactly what it referred to, but yeah, I, I think most of these things go through um, to holomorphic Poisson structures as well. Hello. Yeah. Can I ask something? Yeah. So I was just curious, uh, does it hold for when M is a al algebraic variety? Yeah, you can make sense of, of these things in the algebraic category as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I mean, I will focus on, on the smooth setting, but um, I'll, I'll probably mention that later, but um good so that's the so that's the dual um so let me just give you an even more yeah, so let me then pass to the next so you're doing it for me right 
Um, so another class of examples of crossover manifolds as suggested by this construction. So we can actually characterize the Poisson structures that arise in this way on duals of three algebras. So there's actually a correspondence between um, Poisson structures, so the algebras, and here, Poisson structures. So that's a very important, a very important um, source of examples of Poisson manifolds. Very, very important. So um, on the one hand, so what is a linear Poisson structure? So a linear Poisson structure is a Poisson bracket or a Poisson structure defined on a vector space. So you have a vector space, and you have, so the zero is identified with the linear functions on the vector space, right? So this sits inside the smooth functions. And I will say that uh, a Poisson structure is linear if it preserves this subspace. So linear is that the Poisson bracket of linear functions is linear again. Okay. And um, because guys are is identified with the dual um, you see that if you have a linear Poisson structure in a vector space you get a Lie algebra on the dual and on the other hand you know if you have a Lie algebra on you know if you have a Lie algebra you can you know argue the same way um, So, so the way you do that, you know, it's, a, it's again the same argument. So, so if you have a Lie bracket now, so you see the Lie algebra as linear functions on its dual, it's the same thing. So now if you have a bracket here, um, what you prove is that there's only one way for you to extend this to a bracket here satisfying the Leibniz rule, okay? And then you use the fact that you only have to check the Jacobi identity on coordinate functions because of this tensorial nature of the bracket, right? And well, because, you know, because a basis here will be coordinate functions on G star, right? So if you, if you have a bracket here that extends this one, on the basis, it will be just a D bracket. And the Jacobi identity will be satisfied for those, and therefore this will satisfy the Jacobi identity. Okay, so that's roughly the idea. But, but something to have in mind is this: that Lie algebras are source of examples of a certain class of Poisson structures. Okay, so we have you know we can take direct products of Poisson manifolds. This will also be in the problem set for you to work out the properties of this product. But it's important to have that in mind. Um, one more. Okay, so another class of examples related to Lie theory, and um, and um, you know that is related to the theory of to the theory of quantum groups, um, is the following. Uh, so. <clears throat> Yeah, so here, well, just like to have something concrete. So work out some structure here. Okay, so you have, yeah, there are simple formulas for those. Um, anyway, yeah, so here, you know, in R3, <laughs> So that you have a very concrete formula in mind. The vector product. With 
respect to the usual identification of SO3 with R3, the Lie bracket becomes the vector product. And that's where this formula comes from. So this gives you a Poisson structure on R3, which is the dual of SO3. Okay, so there's a more general class. So this actually generalizes dual, dual of Lie algebras. Um, of Poisson structures coming from Lie groups. I'm just mention that quickly. Um, so here, by, by a Poisson Lie group, I mean a Lie group. So this is a class of Poisson manifolds that arises in the theory of quantum groups, for example, with a Poisson structure. So this is a Lie group. Poisson structure and the compatibility, um, there's a compatibility between the Poisson structure and the group, which is that the group multiplication of the Poisson map, where here it puts the product Poisson structure that I mentioned before. Okay, so it's a very interesting class of, um, um, of Poisson manifolds. So you can check that this is equivalent to the following condition that the bivector at a point, which is the product of G and H is left pi H plus right pi G. And from this formula, it's very easy to conclude that such Poisson structures, they always vanish at the unit element of the Lie group. So as long as they are non-trivial, um, they will really be non-trivial in the sense that they will have like, you know, very rank, right? Because of the identity, they are zero. Okay, so if they're not zero everywhere, they will be interesting. Um, and there is a, a related um, class um, of, of examples coming for example, so these are just Poisson homogeneous spaces. So a class of examples of Poisson homogeneous spaces is when you have a closed subgroup that is a Poisson subgroup, okay, which is a Poisson submanifold for which the inclusion is a Poisson map. Then the quotient inherits Poisson structure as well. Okay, so examples of this. So there's a very you know important theorem in this whole story, which says that um, any compact semi-simple Lie group um, and their co-joint orbits uh, of this type will inherit will have non-trivial Poisson structures. Okay, so for example. Give me two more minutes just to wrap this up. <laughs> um, so, for example, SUN has a very interesting Poisson structure. We will talk about it a bit later. And its core joint orbits, you know, are flags which include, for example, CPN. Or Rasmanians, etc. So these all inherit non-trivial Poisson structures by this, by this theorem, by this construction. Um, so in particular, we will try to describe a bit, say more a little bit about this and this. You know, in which case the quotient is just the, this hot vibration. So there are like interesting Poisson structures here and here. They're very concrete. Um, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what happens here, yeah, what happens here is that, yeah, so these Poisson structures here, they will not be symplectic. 
right? Yeah. What happens is that they're they're compatible in a certain sense. So it's even more interesting than that. Right? You have here, you know, in, in core joint orbits, you have a symplectic structure always. And um, you know, these Poisson structures I'm talking about, they're not symplectic, but in many cases, like CPN, they will be compatible in a certain way. And out of this compatibility, you can generate a family of Poisson structures, kind of interpolating between them. Okay, um, so my last, Cedric, yeah, <laughs> I don't know why I still try. Oh. Yeah, so my, I, I can't finish this without mentioning this class of Poisson structures here in this place. I have, I would just chop off my head. Um, so this is a very interesting class of Poisson structures that have been heavily studied recently. They will probably show up in Jonathan's lectures later. Um, and next week in um, Song's talk and possibly um, maybe Marius Kreinig's talk. Um, so what happens here is that, um, so you have an even dimensional manifold and you have a Poisson structure that, um, so basically you take its um, end power. So this gives you a section of the top power of TM, right? And the requirement is that, um, you know, this section is transverse to the zero section there. So what this means locally, to make this more concrete, is that um, locally, this guy is a function times this. And, and the condition, this, this transversality condition says that zero um, is a regular value of F. So basically it says that the derivative of F is not vanishing at points where F vanishes, okay? So what happens here is that this gives you, this distinguishes for you a certain codimension one submanifold that lives inside your Poisson manifold. Um, basically where the Poisson structure degenerates. You know, the Poisson structure is non-degenerate. It's symplectic away from this submanifold and degenerates there in a certain way that I will explain possibly um, later. And, um, and because this is you know, close to symplectic geometry, many of the techniques from symplectic geometry applies for, uh, apply here to the study of this class of Poisson structures. Um, and, and this fits into you know, a, a wider class of Poisson structures, which can be effectively described by symplectic Lie algebraids. So I hope to talk about them. So they are symplectic in a certain sense, but not really on the manifold, but on something related to the manifold. So you replace the tangent bundle of the manifold with something else, and it is something else, it's symplectic, okay? Um, so there are, did I miss any ever? There are so many these days, you know, I don't know. So there's like, you know, yeah, whatever. I'll talk more about what they are later. So I'm, I'm out of time now. So just, some more examples that I won't touch, but are there in case you're interested. Um, yeah, I'll just stop here. Thanks.